Um, now I, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Stephen Cannon. Uh, Dr. Cannon is, uh, well, he's, you know, trained in, in uh, Johns Hopkins uh, and then Harvard. Uh, so these are the top medical uh, schools in the world. Um, and he's just a, a, a virtual genius. He has uh, too many accomplishments to list, uh, honestly. Uh, currently, he's chair of uh, the physiology department at UCLA, but he is just a giant in the field of periodic paralysis, ion channelopathies, neurology in general, and uh, you know people around the world would be uh, so thrilled to you know have him and we're lucky to have him here. So it's extremely humbling uh, and uh, we're um, very happy to have Dr. Cannon. Welcome. I wish my mom could have heard that introduction. <laughs> Uh, sure, if you could. So it's terrific to be here. This is my fifth time uh, at the PPA conference, and I enjoy every single one. I learn something new every time. It's definitely a two-way street, and I really appreciate you all sharing your stories. Um, it helps those of us who work in this area be uh, better investigators and physicians. So, um, yeah, that's fine. So I'm sort of a data-driven person, and Dr. Bond asked a really great question yesterday about breathing difficulties and periodic paralysis, and I felt challenged, so I went and looked at the reprints I had on my computer. And here we go. So this is one of the uh, first papers uh, describing uh, hypokalemic periodic paralysis in the 70s. No difficulty was ever experienced in swallowing or breathing but during a severe attack, the patient could not even lift his head. So there are examples out there where uh, breathing and swallowing is uh, surprisingly unaffected. It's not universal, however. This is one of the best descriptions of hypokalemic periodic paralysis uh, out of the Netherlands. There's a huge family, 120 members of which 64 have hypopp, 38 of whom have symptomatic attacks. Uh, uh, if you ever get a chance, Tara Links will give a terrific talk. But here she's mentioning that um, the muscles, muscles around the face, so there's no double vision, there's no drooping of the eyelids, no difficulty in speaking or swallowing. So a lot of this is preserved, but there was uh, some shortness of breath sometimes. So there's a little bit there. So like most things in biology and medicine, there are no absolutes. There are a lot of in-betweens. And then another paper, um, just to give another example. Sorry, this clicker. It's a little tired. Jake, this was your paper. You should have mentioned this yesterday. So Jake, uh, working with Frank Lehman Horn, did a survey of 94 genetically proved cases of hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, so hyperpp as well. And you can see the relative uh, frequency of reporting. This is uh, patient reporting of symptoms. And you see the areas of the body that are affected by weakness. And uh, while breathing can be affected, it's uh, less common um, than, than other muscle groups. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, I, uh, you know, I think there, there needs to be a correction out there in the literature that says breathing is spared, always spared, because it's not. Just look at Jake's video online. You can see it. And, and physicians and families need to be aware of this. But it is an interesting fact that it is relatively spared. And first of all, of course, that's terrific for all the affected individuals, but also as a scientist, I would say there's something we could possibly learn there, because if we knew why the respiratory muscles were relatively spared, perhaps we could help a lot of other uh, musculature. Okay, so I'm going to uh, cover three big topics. Um, fortunately, uh, Dr. Weber introduced you to some of these yesterday, um, so uh, hopefully it'll be some reinforcement, looking at some of these things uh, from a uh, slightly different perspective. And I'm going to you know, start out to make sure everyone's on the same page and look at the question, you know, what's going on? Why am I weak? What happens um, during a, uh, an acute attack of weakness and periodic paralysis? So I'll start out, um, I can't figure out where to point this to make it go. Uh, <laughs> okay, it, it should, shouldn't matter where I point. Um, so on the left here is a picture of uh, a mammalian muscle fiber. That's this pink thing. So one individual muscle fiber is about the thickness of a human hair. Could be very, very long, up to several millimeters or centimeter or more. 
And each of your muscle fibers makes a single contact with a nerve. So this is the information coming from the spinal cord to tell this muscle when to contract. Um, there's a single point of contact, very special area called the neuromuscular junction. But the point I want to make is that this information that's coming to say it's time to go, contract, is coming into a very local place on the muscle. And yet the whole fiber needs to synchronously and very reliably contract. And so there's a, there's a problem sending the message out. And so that is accomplished by this spread of an electrical depolarization that you heard about, the action potential. And not only is it a problem that the information needs to get out along this fiber, which um, again would extend on this scale way out, you know, for several hundred meters in either direction, but uh, although this is only the thickness of the human hair, in terms of cellular events, that's a rather uh, large diameter system. And deep inside this, if you take a cutaway view, there's a schematized diagram. These little rods, these are the actual filamentous proteins that enable the actin and myosin that enable contraction to occur. And what has to happen is in response to the signal from the, coming in from this motor neuron from the spinal cord saying it's time to go, is these electrical events also have to spread radially deep into the fiber. There's a special system of invaginations that does that. And what it causes from these, these are depicted in blue, there are these little sacs containing calcium that releases the calcium, and that's the trigger that makes the chemical events happen. So it's this electrical spread that then gets sensed actually by the calcium uh, channel and talks to another channel um, inside the muscle and releases calcium, and that's what, what's happening. So in periodic paralysis, it's the problem in the electrical signaling between the information coming from the nerve and telling all these events to occur. And when there's a defect in this electrical signaling, it can happen in either of two ways. There can be too little or too much. And in hyper, uh, excuse me, in periodic paralysis, it's too little. So what I'm showing here schematically as a graph is this event we're talking about, this electrical impulse, this so-called action potential saying it's time to go. So your muscles, just like your nerves and your heart, these are all tissues in the body that are electrically excitable. Um, that's how they send information and do things like set the timing of the heart rate and so forth. They're actually sitting there like a little charged battery, which means there's a voltage difference across the cell. This is what Dr. Weber was talking to you about. And it's about a tenth of a volt. So in a muscle cell, if the nerve isn't saying it's time to go, it just sits there and your battery is charged at about a tenth of a volt, that's 100 millivolts, and you just sit there. We call that the resting potential because the muscle's at rest, it's not contracting, and that's what a healthy muscle would do. It's mainly the potassium and the chloride channels that are enabled, enabling the muscle to stay there, ready, waiting to go. When the appropriate signal comes here on this diagram, it's this little blue pulse, it could be, this would be the input from the nerve, or in an experiment, you could inject a current. In any event, <coughs> you start the system going, and whoosh, there's this huge change in the um, electrical potential across the cell. This is the action potential. This is what then would, would be passed along and tell the calcium to be released. This is what the sodium channels are doing. You've heard about sodium channels as one of the other ones. And then the calcium channels respond to this and help the, the uh, calcium be released. So what happens in all forms of periodic paralysis, whoops, went too far, but that's all right, is that this battery is partially run down. So the resting potential isn't at about a tenth of a volt, 100 millivolts, it's, it's you know, 50 millivolts or so. And what happens, well, you might think, well, gee, I'm, I'm partway there. I've got, you know, why isn't it telling me to go? But what happens is <laughs> when you sit partway there, it inactivates, it turns off those sodium channels, the ones that are supposed to make this big explosive spike event. And when they're chronically turned off, even if you apply a stimulus and tell the muscle it's time to go, it won't because all of its sodium channels are normally shut off. That's part of the process for how this thing turns off and resets itself all the time. But the problem is if you're always partially, your batteries run down, then the inactivation mechanism keeps this thing shut down. And that's what happens in all forms of periodic paralysis uh, during an uh, episode of weakness. On the other side, uh, we're showing the other event that can happen with an ion channel disorder of skeletal muscle. Uh, 
in which the ex electrical excitability is abnormally enhanced. So this is this involuntary after contraction that uh, neurologists call myotonia that you can either see uh, with the difficulty of letting go or after squinting you can't open your eyes or here in uh, tapping the calf muscle with the reflex hammer there's this dimple in the muscle because it's uh, involuntary persistent contraction after being tapped uh, with the needle uh, electromyogram this is a a way to record the electrical activities from muscles not because you're measuring what's inside the cell it's actually a needle uh, metal electrode hooked to a very sensitive amplifier and all these spiky events represent involuntary action potentials that are occurring during this myotonia if you were to measure what's going on inside the cell, you'd see the equivalent something like this. So here you see too many action potentials, that's myotonia, and not able to make a, an action potential, that's what's happening in periodic paralysis. Now, as all of you are aware, there are many different variants of periodic paralysis. We've talked about hypo-PP, hyper-PP, anderson Well syndrome. Uh, I've laid them out. Um, on um, this diagram here, uh, and these are, uh, you know, tongue twisters, most of these names, but these are the individual diagnostic categories that over the last century or so, neurologists have recognized their patients with clusters of similar symptoms. So some may have only myotonia that's present since birth, so it's myotonia congenita, or recurrent episodes of weakness. As we heard in the introduction, there's nothing really periodic about periodic paralysis, there's no regular periodicity. It's, it's episodic transient events of weakness, sometimes with low potassium, sometimes with high potassium. Sometimes there's myotonia that paradoxically gets worse with repeated contractions or is cold sensitive, etc. What's interesting is um, I've intentionally drawn this. They lie along a spectrum where on your left, these individuals have myotonia only and never have periodic paralysis. These disorders over on the right have periodic paralysis, but never myotonia. And interesting, there's some in the middle, those of you with hyper-PP know this, or paramyotonia congenita, where the very same individual can have one or the other symptom at different points of time. That was a huge mystery to uh, neurologists and muscle physiologists, because all of these disorders are inherited with classic, you know, Mendelian, all of them are autosomal dominant except uh, myotonia congenita, there's a recessive or dominant form. But if you have an autosomal dominant condition that, you know, half of the offspring is a 50-50 chance, um, that's following a pattern where the, it's a, it's a so-called Mendelian disorder named after Gregor Mendel, the early geneticist, that, that one gene is involved. So how, if you have only one genetic lesion, how can you have both enhanced and, and decreased excitability. So that was a, a big mystery. Fast forward, we now know that all of these disorders are caused by defects in ion channels. So ion channels are, are proteins, they're things your DNA is coding for, little molecular machines that are out there in the surface of the cell. They're like little switches that open and close. And each one of these switches opens a, a, a pathway, a, a so-called pore, that the ions can move through. And so some are selective for letting sodium through or chloride, uh, et cetera. So what was interesting is uh, at the outset, people wouldn't have predicted that sodium channel problems can cause many different diseases. That uh, uh, was a little bit surprising. Or turn it around the other way. Individuals with hypokalemic periodic paralysis can have a mutation in either of two ion channels, a sodium channel or a calcium channel. And in fact, the world's experts who had been following these patients for decades had no idea there were going to be two separate subtypes. That didn't become apparent until uh, genetic uh, testing was available. So that's how similar the symptoms can be uh, between these two entities. And if you think about it, there, there was a huge puzzle because I told you in the introduction, the sodium channel, that's responsible for this big action potential, for getting the electrical signal there. The calcium channel responds to that and, and tells another compartment of the cell to release calcium. So these two different channels subserve very different functions in the muscle cell. So how could you get the same clinical symptoms 
from defects in two very different channels. That was a, that was a huge mystery. Dr. Dr. Weber gave you a hint about it yesterday, so maybe some of you already figured it out. Um, but I'll get into that. So the other point to be aware of <laughs> is you, um, there are general classes of channels. So a sodium channel, it's, it has that name because it opens, it forms a pore, it lets these little ions, uh, you know, an ion just means a salt that's come apart in water. So salt is sodium chloride, you put it in water, the sodium comes off, that's a, a cation, a positively charged one, and the chloride is negative. So channels are named for which ion they preferentially let through. But there isn't just one type of sodium channel. The human uh, genome has 10 sodium channels, nine of which we've expressed and characterized. And that's what these little numbers are, the subtypes. And what's important for you, the take home message is, except for an Anderson to Will syndrome, these ion channels are selectively expressed in skeletal muscle, not in nerve, not in the heart. That's why with, with um, typical classical periodic paralysis, skeletal muscle is affected, but people do not have loss of consciousness. They don't have profound sensory symptoms. They do not have, they can have secondary arrhythmias from potassium shifts, but there's not a primary um, problem in the heart. The other thing is there's a lot of jargon out there. <coughs> this is what people have named the actual channels. And there's yet another set of names for the genes. So the genes make the channels. This is the class of channel. So this is, this, uh, is the type of um, nomenclature that you would get back on a gene report. So the SCN type 4, it's the, the sodium channel type 4 is the one that's in skeletal muscle. Type 5 is the one in the heart. This is the calcium channel. and they're, um, a couple of different uh, potassium channels that could be involved. So this is the big picture. The point is all of these types of, of periodic paralysis, whether it's a sodium channel, a calcium channel, or a potassium channel, during an episode of weakness, the problem is your battery is partially run down. There's a partial loss of this resting potential of the membrane. So that's in common with all forms. And what's different is, is how do you get there? Why is your battery run down? And there are different reasons for that. Therefore, there are different triggers because there are different flavors of ion channels um, that have defects. So um, a little apology here that um, I'm going to focus a lot of what I say today on hypokalemic periodic paralysis. I know there are people here with hyper-PP and anderson to will syndrome. I'm happy to talk. Um, you know, during the break or things like that. It's interesting, um, it's sort of a historical thing. So the first mutation that was found was in hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, one of the sodium channel mutations. We quickly learned what was uh, going on and wrong there. The channel misbehaves, it, it stays open and doesn't completely inactivate. And um, so that's what everybody was talking about in the 90s. And even though we knew the gene defects in hypopp, it wasn't until 2007, some 13 years after the initial gene discovery, that we had the insights to understand what's going wrong and why is it that a mutation in either of two channels can end up causing the same clinical phenotype. So that's a newer story, and that's what a lot of people are still focusing on and what, what I'm going to tell you about today. So the second big topic is um, what's going on in hypokalemic periodic paralysis, and as Dr. Weber told you, it's leaky channels. And um, this not only helps us understand um, the triggers and what causes the disease, but also opens the door for development of new therapies. So let me introduce the problems in hypopp with a couple of cartoons. Uh, these cartoons uh, represent the way we think about an ion channel. So what I'm trying to show you here, this gray um, box would represent the membrane of the cell. So that separates outside from inside. So it would be I'm just a little cutaway view of a little piece of the cell. These channels are made up of about a little over 2,000 individual amino acids. So it's a big set of instructions. It's like a string of pearls. And here's your string of pearls going in and out of the membrane. And it's because of the little types of pearls, that is, the amino acids that are there that enable this um, to function as, for example, a calcium channel. And uh, what I'm, the letters indicate up here are mutations that have been found in hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And the very first mutation was this arginine 528 histidine, this so-called R to H. People use single letters to uh, 
for abbreviations. Um, but the point I want to make is um, if you look at this, even if you don't understand what all the parts are, you see how there's sort of four elements that are repeated here? And all of the locations where the hypo-PP mutations are all these triangles that are always in the fourth segment within each one. All these mutations begin with the letter R. These are all consistent features of the mutations associated with hypokalemic periodic paralysis in the calcium channel, all but one. There's one oddball. So when scientists and physiologists saw this, um, we were all really excited because um, there's a big implication of having this type of uh, missense mutation in, in a protein. So you, uh, there are 21 different amino acids, so 21 different kinds of pearls you could put on your string, and it's which amino acid determines how this will function. But of those 21 amino acids, only two of them have positive, permanent positive charge, arginine and lysine. So why do you care if your pearl has a charge on it? Well, <laughs> these things open and close, these channels function, they respond to the voltage across the membrane. And in order to be able to do that, to be sensitive to voltage, you need charge. You know, if you have a charge thing sitting in an electric field, it causes the charge to tend to move to the opposite charge, right? So these were uh, very special types of pearls. The arginines, everybody was excited. We thought something's going to go wrong with how this channel opens and closes in response to voltage, but we got stuck because nobody could find a consistent change. And the other problem was um, of all the tricks we have to study ion channels, the calcium channel from skeletal muscle is really annoying because it doesn't like to make, uh, you can't make calcium channels in other simple systems like frog eggs or skin fibroblasts or things like that. And so the system to study functionally what's going wrong, we were very limited. So that's why we were part of the reason we were stuck for 13 years. And then um, Dennis Bowman and his colleagues in Canada, actually, described a family, big family, that had classical hypokalemic periodic paralysis, and they couldn't find a mutation in the calcium channel. This is now 1999. Around 1999, there was this, this dichotomy. If you had hyper-PP or paramyotonic congenita, you have a sodium channel problem. If you have hypo-PP, you have a calcium channel problem, and the world was clean and simple, and there was a separation. But Dennis had this big family that had classical hypo-PP. He would be like some of you out there, nobody knows my gene defect, right? So it turned out 20% of patients with hypo-PP that's clinically indistinguishable have a mutation in the sodium channel. And this was the opening shot in 1999. And then all the uh, molecular geneticists, Frank Lehman Horn, Bertrand Fontaine, um, Mike Hanna, Louis Tejcik, they all went back to their freezers to those mystery cases of hypo-PP where they couldn't find a mutation in the calcium channel. And they be began to find mutations in the sodium channel. Well, that's great, except not only did they find mutations, they all start with the letter R again, right? So this is... Uh, uh, incredible coincidence. They're all arginines in the, in, the, in the sodium channel, all 11 of them. And in the calcium channel, <laughs> sorry, it's, clicker. it's eight of nine. There's only one oddball. And it turns out the oddball, I'll show you later, behaves the same way. So we all recognize there must be something very special about this because this is, this is sort of um, what's required in order to have susceptibility to hypo-PP. And we were trying to figure out what's going on. The, there was um, a, a new opportunity here because unlike the calcium channel, which as I mentioned is really annoying to work with, the sodium channel expresses beautifully in these artificial cells and systems and frog eggs, and we could, we could try to see what's wrong. And right around this time, um, we benefited from other scientists studying the way ion channels work, they weren't working on periodic paralysis at all. This is why you have to support all of science. You don't know how it's going to pay off. They were trying to understand how do channels open and close in response to changes in the membrane voltage. Very fundamental feature of ion channels. They're so-called voltage sensitive. How does that work? 
they knew it had to have something to do with this special segment crossing the membrane. These are, it turns out, well, I'll show you later, these are um, helical spirals that are crossing across the membrane here. Only one of them had a lot of charges in it, which would cause it to be voltage sensitive. And so the idea was that when the voltage changes across the membrane, that because of all these charges here, this piece of the protein is actually going to move. Dr. Weber was telling you about this yesterday. It's going to physically move. And people were trying to figure out exactly how much does it move and what's available. And so here's a cutaway view. This green cylinder represents just this one here, where the, it turns out where the hypo-PP mutations are. And all these pluses are those arginines sitting in there. And so Pancho Bezania and some other investigators, they, 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 did, they made mutations to study in the lab, not because they were impatient, but they were trying to understand how this voltage sensor was moving. And they were putting chemical tags that would enable them to detect movement of this sensor. And when they put in the tags, something strange happened. It caused the channel to become leaky. So what happens is, in order for this voltage sensor to move, there has to be sort of another channel, a little sleeve that this can slip up and down in. But the sleeve has to fit very precisely, because if there are any gaps, um, then some of the ions could leak through. And that's what we're showing here, so that if you um, had a mutation up in the top end, near the outside, then when you're at the resting potential and this thing is down, if there's a misfit, this is the charges, this plus is the ion, like, like sodium or something could leak. And then when the membrane becomes positive and this moves up and out, then the leak could stop. So this is what they saw just trying to understand this sensor. So we and many others said, aha, this, this, this could be important for periodic paralysis. So instead of just making mutations to understand how the voltage sensor worked, we made the mutations that had been identified in all of you in hypo-PP, and we inserted the messenger RNA instructions into frog eggs, and they nicely made uh, sodium channels, and then we recorded them. And what we saw, <coughs> again, this is, I don't want to get lost too much in the details, but I just wanted to show you, here's normal. You put in normal channels, and, and you block the conventional sodium and see if it leaks at all. And all these curves, this is multiple trials at different voltages, and they're all very tightly together because there's not much of a leak. The fact that these red curves are all spread apart means there's a leak. These were happening at more negative voltages and it lets more current in. So here's, this is voltage versus the size of the leak, the current. So your resting muscle, I said, is at a tenth of a volt. You're sitting at minus 100 millivolts. You shouldn't have much of a leak. But this big red trace shows you have a much bigger leak happening because of this misfit. And what happens <coughs> is as the voltage gets positive, and this sensor moves, the mutation's up here, this moves and the, and the leak stops. So it's a, it's a leak that shuts on and off with voltage. And we saw that um, first in this R to H. This was the mutation that Dennis Bowman found in that Canadian family. It was the first one we studied. We went on to study quickly all of the other mutations in the sodium channel because that was our friend that expressed well. All 11, 100% of them, if you make this mutation, it causes the leak. The calcium channel was still a little bit problematic. Uh, really, the first way we did it, I'll get into later. We, it's so hard to get an artificial system to make calcium channels for you. We made a genetically modified mouse and did it. But then just later this year, it was discovered that part of the reason we were all having this trouble having, making calcium channels in artificial systems is this protein needs a buddy. There's a, an additional subunit. And if you give the instructions to make both of them, then you can do the experiments in the frog eggs as well. So we're in the middle of doing that. So seven, whoops, seven of nine <coughs> hypo-PP mutations have been tested. Four have been published. All four that have been published cause this exact same leak, including this atypical variant that's not at an arginine. It's, it's at a valine. But what it is, it's the amino acid that's right adjacent to where the arginine is. So it's, it's, on the other, it's in the sleeve instead of in this helix that slides up and down. So the point I want to make is there's this incredible consistency that all the mutations are the same and the functional defect is the same. So that's very powerful evidence 
that you really have discovered something fundamental about what's wrong and what causes the susceptibility to your battery running down in hypo-PP. Some other new information, not from our group, from Bill Catterall's group, is um, there have been new advances in technologies to be able to look at the atomic structure, to get a, not a photograph, but a, an image of what these proteins look like more than just these stylized line diagrams. And the reason that's important is if you really know at the atomic level the 3D structure, then you can understand possible binding sites and place to develop drugs and, and things that could help. So here's a picture of the rendition of um, uh, the sodium channel. Uh, that, that it, uh, and we'll show you where the leak is in hypo-PP. So you see the four different colors. The four different colors, each color represents one of these units. So you see there are these internal repeats where it's very similar and it, it repeats four times. So they've colored one, each different color. And you're looking down at the top. So it's as though the screen is the plane of the membrane and uh, perpendicular to that screen is how you would get inside the cell. The, the conventional pore that sodium goes through in this sodium channel is smack dab in the center. There's a symmetry. And these little curly Q things are the helical segments of the protein. It naturally wants to fold that way. That's how it moves in and out across the membrane. And if you count them one, two, three, four, this is the fourth helix. That's the one where all the arginines are. This is where there'd be four copies of this. That's where those hypo-PP mutations are. So if you take this little structure, so it turns out this part of the little molecular machine makes the pore, makes the actual conduit through the membrane. And these other parts here are, are what enables it to be voltage sensitive, and they open and close a gate on this pore, depending on what the voltage is. So what we saw was a problem of a leaky voltage sensor. So if you take this voltage sensor now and rotate it 90 degrees, so here are these arginines, the first, the second, the third, all these R's. So let me put, here's the membrane, here's the outside, the inside. So we've rotated this. And by knowing all of this, what scientists have been able to do, I know it's a little hard to appreciate visually, is by, by understanding the differences, the distances, excuse me, between individual amino acids that make up these ribbons, you can see there's the potential to, for there to be a crevice, to make a leak. Um, that could occur. And what happens is <clears throat> from the outside, there's this big sort of open vestibule. And from the inside, there's a big open crevice. These are water filled. They could have salts that could allow the thing to be leaky. And in yellow here, there's a very special midpoint that keeps the channel from normally being leaky. So what these individuals were able to do is this is the structure of a normal, turns out, a little technical, this is a bacterial sodium channel because the mammalian one is hard to make, uh, get the structure of. But it's very similar to it. And so what they did is they introduced hypo-PP-like mutations. It's the equivalent of um, the R to G mutation, the R672G. I think that's the one you have, Jake, actually. Yeah, this is Jake's mutation, okay? So um, one of the other things is when you, when you um, get these structures, you, you, you grow these uh, proteins, these crystals, it's in the absence of the cell, so there's no voltage. So the picture you really get is when the voltage is zero, which is okay, but that's not where you normally sit. It's like your battery's completely run down. So we get a rundown battery picture. And so here it is with, um, at the second arginine, putting in Jake's glycine instead of an arginine. That's Jake's mutation right there. And what you can predict by this crevice is how much water could fit in there. So these purple blobs are how much water you could fit in that model. And what you see is when it's depolarized, when it's at zero, the water can come in from the outside and from the inside, but there's not a complete path, so this would not be leaky. But if you, and this is now, you have to do computer modeling because we can't get the picture when you're at the normal resting potential. But if you do that, what happens, you'll notice everything moves in a little bit. So this third arginine is instead of above the yellow, it's now below the yellow. And so there's Jake's mutation getting in the way. And now this water channel can go all the way across. So there's the leak because of a hypo-P mutation um, 
in this model sodium channel. And if you were to put um, the normal arginine back in and, and model what would happen if you're down at the resting potential, um, there's a discontinuity, so you don't have the leak. So I know this is technical, but I wanted to share with you the excitement. This is very recent stuff, just came out in May, that we're really getting an atomic picture of the leak. And once you know the geometry of the leak, you can design drugs to plug the leak, which would be the silver bullet for hypo-PP. So uh, again, Dr. Weber introduced this to you yesterday, is that there was a head start in trying to find something that could plug the leak. And it turns out that people, scientists who are interested in ion channels, have studied venoms and toxins from things like scorpions and spiders and sea anemones, because the way those predators can rapidly paralyze their prey is they've developed these toxins that they make where the site of action is an ion channel, because if you can neutralize an ion channel quickly, you can paralyze the animal. And so one of the spider venoms was known to bind this area in domain two, right, happens to be, um, I'm sorry, in domain one. And so here is the data that Dr. Weber had mentioned as a hope. So here's a leaky channel in blue. So this is the voltage you're testing it at. So when your battery is run down, the leak is closed. When your battery is charged at your normal resting potential, you've got a big leak, big inward leak. And what these individuals showed uh, um, is that with this toxin that's from the, the uh, crab spider, you can reduce the size of the leak. So it's partially blocking. So that's pretty exciting. And it was for, for two different um, mutations. This is not Jake's mutation. This is in domain one. These are very rare causes of hypo-PP. Um, but in both cases, it partially blocked the leak. This is very small amounts of the protein, uh, micromolar, OK, so really, really small concentration. The problem is, the challenge is, when this toxin is sitting there binding to this voltage sensor, it also messes up the normal sodium current. So again, I don't want to get too bogged down in the details, but I want you to graphically appreciate if you studied normal channels or these mutations that are uh, mimicking hypo-PP mutations, these colorful plots is what the normal sodium current is supposed to be through that central pore. And the problem is, if you put on enough of this toxin to block the leak, you also block the main current through the pore. So this is not ready to go into clinical trials or anything like that. But it's an interesting proof of principle that there are molecules that can interact with this part of the channel and potentially block the leak. And so now the challenge is to find variations on that where you can stop the leak but not also uh, block the channel. OK, so that's hypo-PP, the leak, wanting to stop the leak um, and um, potentially being an, a, a wonderful new opportunity for therapy. So I think I have, uh, we started late, right? So I have a couple minutes left. The, the last topic I wanted to talk about is the fact that um, we've made genetically modified mice. So we introduce a point mutation um, that's the exact equivalent of what occurs in someone with periodic paralysis. We have three different mice, one hyper-PP mouse and two hypo-PP mice, one calcium channel mice and one sodium channel mouse. Um, that's not what they look like, but uh, <laughs> for those of you who know in medicine, when you're in training, you're taught, if you hear hoof beats, think horses, not zebras, because symptoms are usually due to common disorders, not rare disorders, but we made a hypo-PP mouse. And so what we are able to do with this mouse is uh, study the tissue in isolation, something that was done in the late 60s and 70s in very heroic experiments, heroic both on the standpoint of the patients and Frank Lehman Horn. Those were incredibly difficult experiments to try to understand what's wrong with the electrical properties of a, f of a you know, fully developed mammalian muscle. So we can now take the mouse muscle, put it in this little temperature controlled organ bath. Here if you zoom in, this is the calf muscle from a mouse. Uh, tied with a couple of sutures here. These two probes are uh, platinum wires, which we apply a shock, and the muscle will contract. So here we can measure contraction of uh, mouse muscle and uh, from animals that have periodic paralysis. So the first thing we did <coughs> was make uh, 
the hypo PP mouse with the sodium channel mutation. Um, this was very interesting to us because at the time, there was still a lot of controversy that a sodium channel mutation could cause hypo PP instead of hyper PP, right? Because that was the initial dogma. So we made that mouse. We took the muscle out of the, of the calf muscle and, and stimulated it artificially and measured how much force it could make. And it has uh, periodic paralysis. So what I'm showing here is force as a function of time. This is a half a second here, so very uh, brief contractions. So when you stimulate a muscle, and this is the normal mouse, so normal gene, normal gene. <clears throat> There's a blue and a black trace in, in normal potassium, and then we really challenged the potassium. We lowered the potassium to two. I think all of you with hypo-PP know that if your potassium were two, you'd be in dire straits. But the wild-type mouse can tolerate that pretty darn well, right? There's only a small drop in force. If you take our mouse that has one bad copy uh, of the sodium channel gene, so only one uh, copy of the mutation, <clears throat> the force is pretty good at baseline, but you put it in two millimolar potassium, big drop in force. You put it back in normal potassium, it comes back. What doesn't usually happen in humans, uh, unless they're families of interrelatedness, is have a double copy, so both copies of the sodium channel are mutant. The animal still is viable and, and can actually um, live the normal life expectancy and breed and everything else. But you can see the enhanced susceptibility. First of all, the force is a little bit um, lower to begin with, and if we give the two millimolar potassium challenge, phew, the, the force just falls through the floor. So I know there are a lot of animal models out there of human disease, especially in neurology, disease, you know, models for Alzheimer's, for autism spectrum disorder, depression, and a lot of those are pretty crude approximations. This is an incredibly robust animal model of periodic paralysis. We, we also made, um, the calcium channel mutation, this is the most common mutation in hypokalemic periodic paralysis, the R528H in the calcium channel. We made that mouse. I'm going to show you the same thing, except instead of looking at <coughs> the raw traces, which you saw here, I'm going to show you just what the, the, the peak force is, just what's the highest amount of force you can get measured over a long period of time. So here, <coughs> over an hour, We've normalized the force. Here's 100% of the force. The open circles are normal wild-type mice, so even if you challenge it with two millimolar potassium for half an hour, it does relatively fine. The calcium channel mouse that has two copies of the R528H mutation is susceptible to um, low potassium, 60% drop in force, males and females, then recovers when um, you return the potassium to normal levels. Interestingly, the mouse that is a heterozygote has one mutant copy and one wild-type copy, so this would be the equivalent of you all. The male mice have weakness and the female are asymptomatic. Many of you know that, especially for the R528H mutation, a lot of the women have uh, fewer or sometimes even no episodes of periodic paralysis later on might get the permanent weakness. So the mouse even reproduces the gender difference in terms of susceptibility to weakness. If you were to repeat this at a lot of several different potassium levels, so we look at different potassium levels, so here four is normal, so here's 100% force, so unquestionably the phenotype is hypopp. The, you don't lose force with high K, you lose force with low K. And if you have a double dose of the mutant gene, it's a little bit um, more susceptible. So this is the type of information we would have loved to have had um, from human muscle material, just impossible. I mean, this was, this was tens of mice, many, many months of recordings. You could just never have access to human material uh, to obtain this sort of dose response curve at that level of resolution. Jake, I have a couple, a little bit more stuff. Are you good for me to go? Okay. So other things we've done with the mice. The other thing we've learned, which has very important implications for therapy, is chloride comes into the picture. So I know this gets kind of confusing. You said it's normally a calcium channel mutation. Sometimes it can be a sodium channel mutation. And now chloride makes a difference. Well, that's just biology is complicated, okay? So if we look at, I'll show you why this is the case. Here is just a stylized cylinder that represents your muscle fiber. 
And there are a lot of different, these colored circles represent those channels or transporters that are letting things like potassium and chloride and sodium go in and out of the cell. And we've just listed the major players there. Don't get all hung up on some of the names, but some are channels, some are pumps, and some are transporters. If you put all these in, which are the major players, and you simulate this mathematically, you can um, reproduce something very consistent about how these players contribute to charging your battery, to getting that resting potential. And Dr. Weber again showed you something similar to this yesterday. So what we're showing here is how well is your battery charged? So normally you want to be charged around minus 90 or minus 100. Zero would be way off of here. So this is the resting potential, your battery charged, your muscle is available, ready, waiting to go. What we're showing is how good your charge is in relation to the extracellular potassium. So as many of you know who follow your potassiums carefully, it's normally you know, three and a half to four and a half millimolar. So your battery is pretty well charged, the black line around minus 95 millivolts. What happens even in normal mammalian muscle, rat, mouse, human, if you lower the potassium, just like Dr. Weber told you yesterday, because the ratio of potassium is getting farther and farther from one as you're lowering it, your battery gets better and better charged, but then something catastrophic happens when your potassium becomes too low, and as he called it, there's this paradoxical rundown of your battery, the paradoxical depolarization. The point I want to make is that happens even in normal muscle, but fortunately we don't experience that because, my gosh, to have a potassium down around 1.5, right, your heart would have gone through, a, you'd be dead, okay? So this is something you can measure in the lab, but doesn't happen in your body. But it was a huge clue, because what this is telling you is that paradoxical depolarization is not just some freaky thing that hypopp muscle does. All muscle will do it if you make the potassium low enough. So what this modeling showed us is that if you add the leak, that little tiny leak current we were talking about and we showed you, it changes this relationship. It shifts this solid black curve to the right. So what happens now is your catastrophic paradoxical depolarization happens at a potassium that's in the normally attainable level in your body. And that's, that's the consequence of the leak. And that's how you um, can get in trouble. The prediction is, and you can, you can really measure this in, in muscle, it's a funny kind of snake S-shaped curve that at some potassium levels, like around three here, you could either be sitting here, have hypopp and have a pretty good, your battery's pretty well charged and you're asymptomatic, or you could be up here and be in trouble. There are two possible levels of battery charge for the same potassium. This is what Dr. Weber was referring to as bistable equilibrium, two possibilities, okay? The insight and where chloride comes in is there's a bias for which of these two possible states is your muscle going to be sitting in? And the answer is depending on how much chloride is inside the muscle. Turns out, I, yeah, I won't do it now, I can explain it if anybody's interesting, it's because of this big chloride conductance here. But basically, if the chloride is high in your muscle, you'll get stuck up here, and if it's low in your muscle, <coughs> you will be on this branch. So here's an opportunity to impact an attack of periodic paralysis. Because if you could use a trick to keep the chloride low inside your muscle, it should help. And there's one major inflow pathway for chloride. That's this so-called NKCC, sodium potassium 2-chloride co-transporter. That's the major way chloride comes in. So if you could use a drug to shut that down, you should bias the inside of the cell to have low chloride, and maybe that'll help. Turns out this transporter is also in the kidney. The drug's available for diuretics. Bumetanide is the drug. So we're going to apply bumetanide. What happens? Here's our sodium channel hypopp mouse. Uh, here's the control force. We put it in low 2K. It has an attack of weakness. We keep it in 2K and put in a little tiny bit of bumetanide. Whoosh, force completely recovers. Okay? Hypo PP mouse with the calcium channel mutation. Again, starting out in normal potassium, good level of force, low potassium, substantial decrease in force. Doesn't completely recover here. We can show that the muscle didn't have irreversible damage because you can wash it out. 
this is still a tremendous improvement. And in fact, if you give the drug before the challenge, you can completely prevent the event from happening in the first place. So very good protection, maybe not complete rescue. But this is, this is quite um, astounding. There's also an implication of this whole system in what you do in your daily lives, because you don't necessarily, uh, there are other implications besides taking bimetanide. So it turns out, that this little transporter, which is setting the balance of how much chloride is in your muscle, it's primarily responsive to your, your state of hydration, how well hydrated you are. Because what this does is it brings a lot of salt inside your muscle if you're dehydrated so that you're, you have a balance across that so you don't have a shrinkage of your muscle cells. So if you're dehydrated, this transporter activity ramps up. So the prediction is, uh-oh, if you're dehydrated and you turn this guy on, you're going to be at higher risk of inducing a paralysis. Conversely, if you're well hydrated, it shuts this down, maybe that would be protective. So we went and used our um, mouse model to look at that. A little bit complicated, I'll take you through. So what we did is we studied the muscle from the left and the right hind limb. One of them was in bumetanide to block that transport of the whole time in red. So in bumetanide, your force is fine, it's great the whole time. In black is the other limb where there was no drug present. And so what we did here at 30 minutes is simulate being dehydrated. We increased the uh, strength of the salts by just 8%. No low potassium, just simulating dehydration, <laughs> tremendous loss of force. If you then superimpose a uh, low potassium on top of that, it's like a double whammy, and there's a dramatic loss of force, um, and you have to wash both of them out before you recover. Conversely, um, if you overhydrate the muscle before you start, for the physicians in the audience, you know this is unattainable in the body, so this was just a proof of principle. But if you are super hydrated, you would shut down that transporter. <coughs> so the muscle tolerates that just fine. Again, in red, the drug is present. It's always blocking this transporter. Here we're using state of hydration to modulate the transporter. So if you shut it down by being well hydrated, not by using a drug, the muscle tolerates that. And even then, when you give a 2K challenge, you're, you're protected because you've used your state of hydration to shut it down. Then if you come back to nor uh, normal hydration, you're, you're not super hydrated, boom, you get the attack. So again, showing that the level of, of uh, hydration is important. Okay. So again, practical implication. So again, Jake, I think I've gone over now. I have one other topic. It would be five minutes. I can, I can, okay. All right. So there's another factor that we've learned from the mice. Not only does the chloride balance important, but the acid-base balance in the body. This is probably how carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are working. And it probably is a contributor to, it's not the only mechanism, but it's a contributor to exercise-induced attacks of weakness. So let me explain how we got into this. So we were very curious to understand, you know, the mice beautifully have this potassium-sensitive weakness, but you all know, you tell us, that one of the most annoying and troublesome trigger factors is exercise, right? And it's, it's actually one of the more consistent ones. So uh, physicians have taken advantage of this in the development of the uh, so-called CMAP exercise test that some of you might have had. The CMAP stands for compound muscle action potential, so you use these surface electrodes. You can monitor the electrical viability of the muscle in real time in the clinic apply this little shock to the nerve and just measure the surface potential here. Uh, in Bertrand Fontaine's lab, Dr. Fournier developed this and improved it. So in, in normal individuals, you establish a baseline amplitude reflecting the excitability of muscle. If you have a brief period of exercise, that's fine, and the excitability stays the same. And the big difference is in an in individual with hypokalemic periodic paralysis, after even this brief exercise for a few minutes, you can see this dramatic uh, decline in the excitability of the muscle. So there, it's really playing on this whole idea of exercise-induced attack. It's a very focal attack, just in, either in the pinky or, or in the thumb, usually. Um, so it's a very robust phenomenon. You all have told us 
that the curious thing is usually while you're working out, the strength is preserved, or sometimes you even feel better, but the weakness comes after you stop exercising, and that it really takes a pretty prolonged workout, usually at least a half an hour or more, in order to be susceptible for this event to happen. So these working on that and the test and knowing how robust the trigger of exercise was, we began thinking, what could be going on here? The challenge is there's so many things that muscle does under vigorous exercise. There's a lot of adaptations, you know, to deal with the fuel that you're using, the acidosis that happens, the oxygen de deficit. There are a lot of things going on. But we decided to focus on the fact that your, your muscles, as a, as a byproduct of metabolism, there's a sort of an acid load that gets produced um, during exercise. Plus, we knew, even from way back in the 70s, that for those individuals who responded to diamox, their blood, as a consequence of diamox, part of its action, it causes you to waste bicarbonate into the urine, and the blood was a little bit acidotic, and that might have been helping it work. So we, we went. And our first thought was, well, maybe acidosis is what protects you during exercise. So we took our mouse model again, and we said, let's introduce a little acidosis. The way you can do that, can't see it here, is um, when you're maintaining this muscle in a, in a bath, uh, it has bicarbonate in the bath, and you bubble carbon dioxide in it. And by changing the concentration of carbon dioxide, you can change the level of acidity. So what we're showing is several different types of muscle, wild type, hyper PP or hypo PP. The interesting thing <coughs> is when we made it acidotic, which means a lower pH, that's here. We did a, uh, whatever it is, 30 minute episode of acidosis. All the muscles tolerate that well. And in fact, we showed you get a little protection there. That's not in this slide. But the amazing thing that we weren't expecting at all is when we return to a normal pH. So this would kind of be the equivalent of the end of exercise big drop in force, interestingly, only in the hypo-PP mouse models, not in the hyper-PP. So I, I know that exercise is also a trigger for hyper-PP, but it must be a different mechanism. And this might not be the whole story, but it's certainly an important contributor, okay? So, so here's like post-exercise weakness relating to acid uh, base balance. Uh, quick details, we, we looked, uh, measured what happens to the pH inside the cell. It's not as if the mutant, the hypo-PP mice were any different from the wild type. So it's not, how do you handle this? Okay, the other question was, well, when the muscle is weak, is it really because of a failure of electrical excitability? You don't know here. All you're doing is measuring force. Maybe this was some other bizarre epiphenomenon that's kind of interesting but irrelevant. So we did another preparation where we could simultaneously measure the force in the mouse muscle and the electrical activity. So here's the force. Here are the raw traces. This is the baseline force recorded here. We do uh, 30 minutes of acidosis. After the acidosis, boom, there's the weakness. You can see the drop in force. Here's the mouse C-map. So we get our mice to do C-maps too. Um, and you can see in red the decreased amplitude in the middle of the weakness. So it's just like the C-map exercise test. This mouse is having a failure of muscle excitability at the end of a period where there's been um, acidosis. I'm almost done. The other thing we looked at is to be set up for this susceptibility to weakness, how long does, quote, the exercise, the period of acidosis need to be? If it's very short, just six minutes, you get a very small dip in strength. If it's been for half an hour, there's a greater loss in force, 80 minutes, even bigger. So the longer you're in this acidosis, the, the, the susceptibility keeps getting worse and worse and worse, but it's very slow, okay? So it takes many minutes. This is what you all have experienced and told us about, but it's very interesting um, because just one cartoon and one data slide, then I'm done. Because the story is, how does this relate to mechanism? Because tens of minutes is very slow on a biological scale of all these things happening. So here is our idea, that you start normal at rest, you have a normal amount of chloride inside the muscle, even though you have hypo-PP, you're doing well because potassium's normal, you can exercise. If you exercise briefly and stop, that's reversible, that's fine. If you exercise for a long time, you begin to develop acidosis, acid in your muscle, this is normal, this is what all of us happen. What happens is if you have sustained muscle acidosis, it, it shuts off the chloride channel. That happens in all of us. It's probably a protective mechanism to help deal with fatigue. That's another story. 
But the interesting thing is normal, strenuous, sustained exercise shuts off the egress pathway, the efflux, how chloride gets out. So what will happen is if you exercise for a long time, the stuff coming in is it's weeny tiny compared to the volume, so it takes a long time, tens of minutes. And if you exercise for tens of minutes, you slowly begin to build up the chloride in the muscle, which we said is a bad thing. Normally, during exercise, you're protected from that because this channel is turned off, so it, it prevents your battery from running down. You're just building up a bad situation, but you don't see the manifestation of it because the channel is shut down. Then if you stop exercise abruptly, the pH corrects quickly, the channel opens, and you're in trouble because now you have too much chloride inside your muscle, and you're going to get an attack of weakness, and then you would slowly recover. So that's our model for how this happens. If this is true, then the killer is that you've built up this chloride and then you suddenly recover, which you know suddenly stopping exercise is not a smart thing to do. So we wondered, what if you slowly correct the acidosis? Could, if you do it slowly enough, could sort of the chloride kind of leak out before the channel comes wide open and you would be protected? So here's my last data slide. So we did this, <coughs> so we're doing the two different muscles in parallel, left and right leg. Here, sorry, it's upside down because the pH, but here's the period where we've made it acidotic, and when, when you recover from acidosis, boom, you get a loss of force. The purple one is a little bit slower, just barely slower, and you get weakness both times. If, again, we reverse one limb very quickly, these are actually in, in the dishes, in the organ bath, and the other one more slowly, you can see there's sort of a difference in the loss of force. And if you make the recovery even more gradual, it's possible to completely prevent the attack of weakness. So we think this is the explanation of the warm down that's protective after exercise. It's because during prolonged acidosis, you've built up this chloride, and what you need to do is not have the acidosis recover too quickly or the channels will open up, you get in trouble, you do it slowly and the, the chloride will slowly come out. So interestingly, if you get in trouble because you didn't warm down enough, this would predict you could start exercising again and, and maybe begin to protect yourself, or you could take out a paper bag and rebreathe into the paper bag and cause respiratory acidosis and maybe get improvement. That would be an interesting experiment to try at home. Um, but that, that's what the prediction would be. So. Um, let me just have a summary. So what we've covered today is learning about the mechanism of hypo-PP, that it, it, it's caused by a leak. And a leak is a leak. As Dr. Weber said yesterday, it doesn't matter whether it's in the uh, calcium channel or the sodium channel. It's the same leak, and so you get the same phenotype, because this is a strange thing these channels aren't supposed to be doing, but it's the same type of deficit. When you have the leak, you're at risk for having a rundown battery. But the amount of chloride in the muscle determines the bias of that rundown. Low chloride would be better situation to be in as opposed to high chloride. And that um, this exercise uh, uh, phenomenon might be related to an acid base situation which is contributing to the chloride buildup. So the take home practical implications are if you want to do things to minimize this buildup of chloride in your muscle, Avoid being dehydrated, or if you're diabetic, don't let your sugar go too high because uh, that's also an osmotic load. Or don't avoid a high salt diet. All these things would stimulate this transporter and bring chloride into your muscle. Be careful after vigorous exercise, stay well hydrated. So not only take your potassium or your carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, but make sure you're hydrated with exercise. Warm down after exercise uh, so that that chloride has a chance to come out without having an attack of weakness. Um, and in terms of uh, the buventinide, which I showed, I believe there's real potential there. Um, Mike Hanna's group in London is starting some limited clinical trials. Although buventinide is available for off-label use from your pharmacist, please don't run out and do it because, of course, it does cause a loss of potassium in the urine, so it could make hypo-PP worse. So there is a balance there that we want to work out carefully and give you good advice so don't get overzealous and rush it, because if, if people were to have an adverse event, it could ruin it for everyone, because then everyone would, would say, oops, this is, this is not viable. But in fact, I think it is. So I'll, I'll uh, stop there. Um,
as we like to do uh, in science, just acknowledge a lot of the people who worked there. And uh, I'm sorry I ran over, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, I'm just wondering if you've studied the effects of, I'm over here, <laughs> oh, yeah. if you've studied the effects of chloride and um, dehydration in hyper KPP and if it's the opposite or the Yeah, same. so um, it turns out that this whole problem with the paradoxical depolarization, that S-shaped curve and the chloride being on the two limbs, that whole system is only going to be set up if you have one of these leaky, channel, leaky channels. The defect in hyper-PP, where it's how the gates are regulated for the normal sodium pore, that causes a completely different set of problems, a different reason for depolarizing. And while this could have an effect, it's going to be tertiary compared to the other fundamental problems. So my prediction and what we saw in the limited experiments we did in the hyper-PP mice, is they don't have the same susceptibility to this chloride shift because they don't have the leak. It's situations where you have that, those leaky channels um, that would put you, um, make you sensitive to the chloride, amount of chloride in the muscle. Yes. Thank you. So I'm one of these people with a high chloride and having the attacks at 3.5. Um, so it sounds like bu bumetanide. <laughs> thank you. Bumetanide would be a good option for me. Yeah. Well, so the caveats I would have is um, first I wanted, would want to make sure somebody has um, a clinically definite diagnosis of hypopp, probably even a known mutation before using something potent like bimetanide, which could change the amount of potassium. In uh, Professor Hanna's limited trials that they've done, they did the first ones, they were looking at the CMAP and seeing whether that recovered more quickly on bimetanide. The, the, the data that they were able to have so far, because part of it is still blinded, is that none of the six or eight patients that they ran through had an adverse event vis-a-vis uh, -vis lowering the potassium as a result of this diuretic. Uh, so it's probably going to be safe. It may work for you, but again, we want to um, work this out. If you go through the math, it turns out that in an attack of hypopp, as you all know, a massive amount of potassium shifts into your muscle, inside the muscle. And that event is a much stronger effect to lower potassium than the amount of additional loss in the urine from this drug, in my estimation. So although you would lose some, clearly, from this drug, by preventing the attack, you would actually blunt the, the drop in potassium that's otherwise going to occur because of an attack. So I think uh, it has great potential, um, but just hold off until we can work out best timing and dosing. Are, are, are but, you saying use it chronically? No, no. No. So we are thinking as abortive therapy. So it turns out that um, there are many drugs actually on the market in this class that block this co-transporter. So Lasix does, furosemide does as well. It's about 100 times less potent, but it, it does it as well. One of the things about bimetanide that's actually good in terms of uh, abortive therapy, it has a very short half-life. So the nice thing is, you know, could I quickly use this to try to correct my chloride in, in, in my muscle and then it's going to be done with and I'm not going to have the diuretic effect for 12 or 24 hours. It's a, it's a few hour half-life. But again, I wouldn't advocate chronically taking this because it is such a potent diuretic. It would probably be co-administered with potassium. I hesitate to say this, but I know some people off-label who have a very weak solution of bimetanide in a water bottle and they just take a few chugs every couple of hours and it's worked for them. But again, I, 
cannot be advocating this, because I, I want to roll it out in a controlled way, um, because we want to make safety is the first important thing. But I think it's a real opportunity. It's a completely separate mechanism from um, the way I think acetazolamide is, and, and dichlorophenamide are working. So there's an interesting possibility that this would be um, an opportunity for abortive therapy on top of being on a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor at the same time. Meaning, okay, so you, you're going to work out, you take the Bumex, <laughs> or you're, you're instantly paralyzed, you take the Bumex, assuming that it were, yeah, yeah. like, where do you, where do you see that? Yeah, it's going to come to the individual. Um, I would advocate the potassium staying well hydrated before exercise and doing a warm down rather than taking this. Um, you know, <laughs> they, they tried to do a double-blind crossover trial on whether bumetanide impacted the CMAP exercise test, and the blinding was really difficult because half of the patients had to get up and pee. Okay. So uh, you have to think about that for, depending on what sport you're doing, whether you want to take bumetanide first. I'll get this one in there. Um, what is the name of the drugs? Starts with D B. Uh, well, D was probably dichlorphenamide, which is Caveus. B is bumetanide. The trade name is Bumex. B U M E X. It's a diuretic that's been around for a long time. If you go to your, again, please don't get overzealous on this. Um, this is used mostly by cardiologists in what they would consider to be end-stage refractory heart failure. Okay, bad edema and retention of water. So, you know, out there in the medical community, there's a little bit of the view that this is, this is a, a last resort heart failure kind of drug, and, and so, so there's a fair amount of caution people have using it. But I've looked at the data when the drug was initially developed, the safety data, people tolerated it amazingly well, and again, Mike Hanna's done half a dozen or so people with hypo-PP, and they tolerated it pretty well. So I, I think there's an opportunity out there, but again, we want to roll it out carefully. Yeah, I was just going to say, you just briefly mentioned that you think that the mechanism that acetazolamide uses to cause the acidosis is different than the Bumex, but was that, uh, I don't think anybody's ever thought that taking acetazolamide, uh, like a, a super dosage of it when you were having an attack is actually a good thing, but couldn't you, couldn't you I don't know, couldn't you take a thousand milligrams when you're having an attack yeah. and that's going to also increase the acidosis? Yeah, so... Yeah, so the acidosis can be uh, protective in, in shutting down the chloride conductance and the efflux pathway. The thing is, it, 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 it's a longer time course, so that's why we don't advocate using carbonic anhydrase inhibitors for abortive therapy. I'm not going to deny that many individuals will say, oh, but when I take, I know if I'm getting in trouble, I take it and then I, I can feel an effect. But the kinetics of it and everything, um, uh, it's, it's not well optimized to do that. But if you think about it, it's two sides of the same coin. The Bumax is cutting down the amount of chloride that's going in, and um, the acidosis um, you know, can, can affect what's going out. And so you can work at it either way. Okay. Uh, what about the potassium chloride? Is that the same chloride you have already in the weak yep. muscle? So good type? question. The question is, what about potassium chloride? So. Um, First of all, chloride is the most abundant anion normally in your blood. So when you take even large amounts of potassium chloride, you can substantially increase your extracellular potassium. You know that. But it's a drop in the bucket because your normal chloride is up around 105 or so. So uh, proportionately, it's smaller. And what turns out is the chloride in your muscle is normally very low inside, like about 4 or 5 millimolar. Um, but under some of these situations of duress, it can possibly double uh, inside the muscle. So chloride that you ingest is not necessarily going to end up inside your muscle is point number one. And point number two is the amount that you're taking in your KCL supplements is only very modest change in the total amount of extracellular chloride. Sorry to Um, so I was just uh, wondering about the acidosis effect and just from the point of view of sleeping in a room that's, say, poorly ventilated, 
Would that cause a build-up of CO2, maybe contribute then to the acidosis, and maybe trigger attack in the morning when someone wakes up? If yeah, so um, the phenomenon about the early morning event, uh, you know, probably has to do with uh, shifts in potassium itself. Um, so in response to normal cortisol cycling and so forth, there have been documented diurnal cycling of potassium as well, which is kind of at a nadir in the morning, which is, is probably where that's coming from, rather than hypoventilation and potential, you know, you'd think sleep apnea or something like that could, could impact this in certain ways. But I think it's probably related to that. What? Oh. Steve, uh, we, we are from Botswana, and you mentioned earlier on about spider bites and uh, so on. So <laughs> I'd like to tell you that about a year ago, I had an experience where I was bitten by a spider at about 4 o'clock in the morning. And uh, when, I, when I got out of bed that morning, I felt as strong as a horse. <laughs> and uh, where normally I have, I have very... Uh, so that my legs are a bit weak in the morning, and uh, I, I normally then have stiffness in my legs. But it was very surprising that uh, when I when I got out of bed that morning, I felt good. <laughs> Later on that evening, I had a big hole in my leg, <laughs> and I had uh, a few injections and a drip and other things. But uh, it certainly seemed to have the effect that maybe you mentioned. I mean, that's an interesting. Um, possibility. The, the venoms that are created by these predator insects and so forth, are, it's an incredibly complex mixture of a lot of different things. And the other thing is your inflammatory response to that and immune and cytokine response, there could have been a lot of factors, but I still like the story. <laughs>